Welcome back to Half the Battle. I'm your host as always, Daniel Levy, your co-host Shaq. We're going to be talking UFC 240, Max Holloway versus Frankie Edgar. And Shaq, it's going down this Saturday in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. One of the greatest featherweights of all time, Max Holloway, is putting his title on the line against the former lightweight champion and the future Hall of Famer, Frankie the Answer Edgar. Yeah, both of these guys, I mean, Holloway at such a young age, he's already got a storied career. You know, he was on quite the streak before he ran into Dustin Poirier down here in Atlanta, but there's no shame in losing to the Diamond, especially up a weight class. And, you know, Frankie Edgar, I mean, what else can we say? It's Frankie. He, you know, he fights with his heart. Frankie's a man. He's a legend. Being, you know, similar opponents as Max Holloway, got a, very, a lot of common opponents. And, you know, we'll, we'll see who the better man is on Saturday. If I would have told you that... There would be a five foot six lightweight champion. You'd laugh in my face, but Frankie Edgar won the belt. He was the shortest man to ever hold a UFC lightweight belt, besides my man Sean Shirk, who Frankie Edgar also beat, by the way. I mean, at the time, you got to think lightweight back then, you know, there was a lot of five six guys. There was Shirk, it was like five three, five four. Uh, Gray Maynard, he ain't that tall. Frankie. Joe Stevenson. Joe Stevenson. <laughs> Those guys are short, man. Uh, Clay Guida, Sean, uh, Spencer Fisher, uh, Tyson you know, Griffin. Tyson Griffin, all those muscles. Very <laughs> true, very true, very true. It's a different era of the sport. And what's so cool is that a guy like Frankie Edgar, not only was he the champ back then, back when he dethroned BJ Penn, but he's had so much longevity in the sport, dropped the weight class, having success at featherweight. And now he arguably gets his last ever title shot against Max Holloway, who's a total stud. We just saw him fight in Atlanta against Dustin Poirier. I cannot wait for this fight, Shaq. It's been a long time coming. Yeah, you know, Frankie's a, a a model of consistency over the years, man. So it's going to be a good fight. Absolutely. Well, we're going to get down to business and break down these fights. But first thing I want to say, today's episode of the podcast is sponsored by my boy, Man Preet, over at MMA Lock of the Night. He's running a UFC betting pool called the Lock of the Night Challenge. And the way this works is you choose your lock of the night or a max bet, basically the one lock you think is going to win every UFC event. You try to accumulate the most amount of units profit and it starts from August until the end of December. So basically the top three winners are going to be paid out with the pot. First place gets 65%, second place 25%, third place 10%. And there's going to be two pools, a $25 buy-in and a $100 buy-in. So two different games, $25 and $100. And to sign up or get more information, hit up my boy Manpre on Twitter at MMALOTN or email him at MMALOTN at gmail.com and let them know that Half the Battle sent you. Well, Shaq, let's get right down to business because first up in the heavyweight division, we got Tanner Bozer, he's 16-5, and five, and Glaucomo Lemos is 6-0. and oh. Currently, they got Bozer minus 170. The comeback on Lemos is plus 150. Well, Shaq, uh, I know Tanner Bozer has wanted to make that UFC debut for a very long time. He is Canadian, finally gets to fight in his home country. But man, uh, there's a reason this is the first fight of the night, and do you think the Brazilian can come out here and keep his undefeated record? Yeah, you know, uh, it's going to be a really good fight. Both these guys, you know, I'll be honest with you, they're not the best. And, you know, Glyco, Glycomo Lemos, very stationary Brazilian, very slow, hasn't really fought much out there. I'm going to go with the hometown guy. I'm going to go ahead and consider this a setup fight, basically. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? If you got that glycoma, you know you got to be hitting up on some of that gelato. But look, as far as Giacomo, Lemos, and Tanner Bozer, the way I see this fight going is you got this one guy in Tanner Bozer who reminds me of Big Country. You know, he's the fat guy with the mullet. And you got Giacomo Lemos who, you know, he's the muscle head with tattoos on his forehead and, you know, doing the whole bit. Both guys are very slow. I'm going to have to favor the experience of Tanner Bozer, but I would be careful laying chalk. I mean, you're talking about a guy who got knocked out by Tim Haig in six seconds, but the reason I'm picking him to win this fight is he does have way more experience than Lemos. I mean, Tanner Bozer was out there on the regional scene in Russia going to decision with some of these guys, so that's a lot more than Lemos has accomplished to this point, so for that reason, I'm going to take Bozer to win this fight. Next up in the welterweight division, we got the return of Eric Newbreed Coke. They still call him Newbreed in this day and age, Shaq. He's 15 and 6, and Kyle Stewart is 11 and 2. Currently, they got this fight a dead pick 'em, minus 110 Coke, minus 110 Stewart. So, you going with the former featherweight to win this fight at welterweight, or are you going with uh, the former Marine, Kyle Stewart, to, to get it done? Yeah, this is going to be a really good fight. Uh, Eric Coke, former number one contender at 145 pounds, was supposed to fight out, though. That didn't work out. Uh, then he fought Lamas. We know how that went. Uh, then that he didn't fought, work out. <laughs> <laughs> then he fought Dustin. We, we know how that went. And then, uh, you know, he moved up to 155. So had a nice little win over the Brazilian, uh, Oliveira. 
Then he got my boy Tractor. Out, he got Tractor, and then he, you know, he beat uh, he got he not got knocked out by Darren Cruikshank with that head kick. It was a very nice head kick, you know. Uh, not a lot of people have seen a move like that coming, so I'm not gonna fully, you know, uh, fault Eric Cole, but I will fault his chin. I mean, he went down, and he, he and, the, and that's after two hellacious beatings from Thomas and Dustin, and then you know he was able to go 50-50, you know, in fights like uh, Shane Campbell. You know, that was Shane Campbell's last year or second to last UFC fight, if I'm not mistaken. You know, he finished him good jujitsu. Uh, and then he fought uh, Clay Guida. You know, he was lying very high in that fight. You know, Clay Guida was coming off uh, KO losses to Ortega, you know, was really struggling. Tiago yeah, Tavares Lars. lost. You know, you would think, like, Coke, new breed, like, let's let's whip up on this old guy real quick. And, you know, Eric went out there and pulled a stunt because... Historically speaking, you know, Eric Newbury Coke at, in his prime, you know, when he was young, when it was in the, the WEC days, he was a guy that used to stay at distance, throw his uh, one two. And at the time, I feel like guys probably, you know, hadn't seen a, a straight one two like that, you know, uh, in the lighter weight divisions. At least, you know, the guys he was fighting, the, the uh, Francisco Rivera's, the, uh, but he did knock out a Sun Tsao, you know, back in the day with that right hook. He did knock out a 35er, and now he's fighting at 70. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, it's just really been, he's been really inactive. He's suffered a lot of injuries throughout the year. The thing with Eric Koch is, you know, he started the sport very young. He started the sport at 18, 19. He was in the WC at 19 years old. So, you know, now he's 30 years old. It's 11 years later. He might have, you know, two two tails, you know. You know, I feel like he did a, did a lot of damage to his body at 145s. And my theory is... The damage that he did there, you know, when he took that in the 155s and he's he's gassing out and getting broken by Clay Guida, you know, Eric Koch's a talented guy, but why is he out here getting fully mounted by Guida? Why is he getting smashed on, you know, uh, not pulling the trigger at distance with his left kick? And then, you know, he takes that into the Bobby Green fight after another layoff, and he wins the first round in that fight. And then towards the end of the first round, he gets hit with an overhand and just complete, completely shuts down and gets his ass beat the next two rounds. You know, he had every opportunity to outposition Bobby on the mat in that fight, and he gave up pretty much, man. So his theory is that, you know, the weight cut to 55 is too much as well. And, you know, that, that, that could be a case for some of these guys, man. I mean, that weight cutting thing is no joke. These guys, these guys do, you know, severe damage to their bodies. And But I personally think it's more just a weight thing with Coke. I think it's a chin thing with Coke. And I think that he just doesn't like pressure. He doesn't like getting hit. You know, he's a very technical guy that likes to fight at a very calm pace. So he can just, he only throws a few combos. He's a, basically like a Darren Till, you know, straight left, uh, left kick. So... I think it's a little bit of more of a, he's one dimensional. Uh, he's a little, you know, if you pressure him, if he's very chinny. And I think that uh, that's really where his issues come from. Now, Kyle Stewart, on the other hand, he had a, a rude uh, welcoming to the UFC from Chance for Encounter his last fight. He took that fight on five days' notice, cut 28 pounds. So, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to really put that much. I will put stock in them getting choked out, but I mean, just let's be honest here. He was going into that fight pretty much a dead man walking. I mean, all that weight he cut, short notice. We already know the numbers uh, for these guys coming in on short notice. I mean, he was doing he was doing from the beginning, and and it definitely showed. So we're gonna definitely see a better Kyle Stewart when Kyle Stewart's at his best. I mean, he's just a dog, you know. Talent wise, I'll be honest, Eric Koch's a lot better than him, just everywhere across the board. The thing is, like I said, when Eric Koch gets hit, he completely shuts down and. When Kyle Stewart hits people, they uh, tend to go into wrestling mode very quickly. I mean, everyone this guy fights tries to take him down because they don't want to get hit with that right hand. I mean, he's got that big of a presence about him. So I think that if Kyle Stewart can make this a dog fight, move forward on Eric Koch, use his size. But I'll tell you what, it looks like Eric Koch went to the anti-aging clinic. It looks like, he, you know, if you look at his Instagram, it looks like he's been, I don't want to say... Uh, He's been putting any needles in his butt, but... So you're saying he has a new doctor. <laughs> it's just saying at 170, he's looking very healthy. So we'll see We'll see what, uh, We'll see see what. how he looks. I think Kyle Stewart's a tougher guy, but I think Coke's the more talented guy. But I, I'll i tell you what, if, if, if this fight, and it's a fist fight, if there's any blood in this fight, if there's any uh, grueling aspects of this fight, Eric Coke will break once again. So I'm going to go with Kyle Stewart by late stoppage third round. I think he's going to eventually touch his chin and... You know, I think uh, Eric Koch, I just think his issues are more than the weight. 
Yeah, some very good points there. Obviously, we got to point out and put emphasis on that Kyle Stewart UFC debut. He was supposed to fight our guy, Jared Nitrain Gooden, in LFA for a main event, actually. And then two weeks before that, he gets called to make the UFC call. So this guy was expecting to, to weigh in, you know, two or three weeks after he got the call. And it's like, nah, dude, you got to actually make 170 in five days. So, you know, of course he... He looked like total shit. I mean, the guy had to cut 28 pounds. Like, it makes all the sense in the world to me. Now, what Kyle Stewart brings to the table, like you already said, very, very heavy right hand. I mean, that's this guy's bread and butter. That's his moneymaker. That's what got him to the point he's at. When this dude lands that right hand, people either turn into wrestlers, they go out cold, they cover up and let the ref intervene. So, Kyle Stewart's going to be looking to set up that right hand all night long. And with Eric Cook, like Shaq said, he's the much more talented guy. He's the more skilled guy. But sometimes it's not about the skill of the man. Sometimes it's about the will of the man. And this becomes a battle of wills. Kyle Stewart's winning that all day long. It's just Kyle Stewart has some holes in his ground game that Eric Koch can totally exploit. And I'm not even just referring to that chance from counter fight. Go back and watch that Jason Jackson fight. He drops the guy. The guy has an injury from the drop. And all you had to do was land two or three extra punches, and uh, the ref would have stepped in. Instead, he goes for this headlock from side control, like a scarf hold, gives up his back from there. It's like, oh, my God, Kyle. So I'm just saying, if Eric Koch takes his back or something like that, because Correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but isn't Eric Koch a Daniel Vanderlei uh, black belt? So, I mean, the guy has a ground game, but the thing that I also got to point out is that Eric Koch did not do this camp at Rufus Sport. He's doing the whole home gym thing. So, I don't really know where his motivation's at. The thing I do know is that Kyle Stewart wants this more than anything. I mean, his life revolves around Saturday night, whereas Eric Koch, I mean, he already had a long career, man. This is fun now. He's not cutting weight anymore, moving up to 170. Now he just does this for fun. So I, I'm going to go with the guy who wants it more, and that's Kyle Stewart. Next up in the flyweight division, we got Jillian Robertson. She's 6-3, and three, and Sarah Froda is 9-1. and one. Currently, they got Jillian Robertson minus 115, and Sarah Froda is minus 105. So Shaq, it's a pick em with a lean on Jillian Robertson. And as we know, Jillian Robertson, she kind of favors submission over position. And in certain cases, it'll work out when fighting the Veronica Macedos and the Emily Whitmires and all these things. But now against Sarah Froda, even though her takedown defense isn't the best, she is a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. She is a Pan Am world champion. So, I mean, do you think Jillian Robertson is going to be able to come out here and choke out Sarah Froda? Yeah, it's going to be a really good fight. I guess you can say Jillian is a submission specialist. All her wins are by sub except one. She does have wins over Cyphers, Whitmire, Meatball, Molly, uh, by uh, Macedo, all by submission. So, she has submitted, you know, some, really some fairly reputable chicks. Um... You know, Froda, on the other hand, had a very good fight with Livia, another black belt in jiu-jitsu. And uh, speaking of Livia, man, she got... <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> she got worked the other day. So, yeah, you know, um, I will say that, you know, I think Froda, you know, and Livia are probably a little bit ahead of Jillian overall, you know, just in terms of intensity, uh, you know. But Jillian's a specialist. She's, she's uh, like you said, some mission over... Uh, Position and her jiu-jitsu is getting him better. I mean, she's she's one-dimensional. You know, it's a. Uh, I don't want to say she's like. Uh, I wouldn't classify her as like one of these elite submission specialists. What did like, uh, <laughs> What did my boy Eddie Alvarez say? Yeah, uh, you know, Eddie Alvarez said, you know, on tough when she was getting ready to fight at Barb Honchak, if she can't get a sub, she usually quits. And you know, he called her a quitter during the fight, and he said, you know, she was uh, looking for ways out, and all the girls were yelling at Eddie, she is not. <laughs> I mean, Eddie was adamant that she was a quitter. Like he was like, "Bro, Jimmy's a quitter." Eddie was fucking hilarious on that season. Like, Sarge bro, or he something. Got into it with all these girls, bro. Like they hated him. So yeah, hey, Eddie, shout out to my boy Eddie. <laughs> Eddie was pretty adamant that Jillian was a quitter, and you know, uh, she's not. She's gotten pretty better with it, man. You know, the Barb Honchak fight, she was really behind. But I'll tell you what, she closed that gap, and that's because she's been training at ATT, and she's got fighters like Joanna, Amanda. Androv, you know, uh, you know all these world class fighters around her. She's a, a, you know, at a very young age. So, you know, I'm assuming that Jillian Robertson's probably going to be getting a lot better. Probably going to get a lot better at utilizing her skills a lot more sooner. Now, in the fight that she lost against uh, against uh, Myra Bueno in Brazil, 
She came out there, got the takedown right away. Bueno, I'm pretty sure she's a black belt as well. And Bueno uh, was able to attack her with arm bars, get them to stand back up. And when they got back on the feet, the Brazilian started to tee off. And that's not what Jillian likes. And she can escape it, you know, when she gets these quick subs against Whitmire, who's a complete joke, if we're being honest. And Meatball Molly, that's a, a legit win on her record. But let's not forget, Meatball Molly had a very big head going into that fight. She missed weight. weight going into that fight. And uh, she paid the price, and we've seen what Meatball Molly's gone on to do since then. And then uh, shout out to my boy Shaq cashing that plus two forty five yeah, against exactly. Fraud Lipsky. <laughs> Fraud Lipsky, and then you, you know, know how much shit we got for that. <laughs> and then uh, Veronica Macedo hasn't won a UFC fight, so I'll say Jillian's been having success against uh, at least girls that I, I've used. Sarah, I think Sarah Frota are, uh, that is better than I feel like Sarah Frota. Her biggest issue is that she needs a little bit more of a sense of urgency, you know what I'm saying? You know, uh, she's a very slow starter, but that could be because she's been fighting at 115 pounds, you know? Her last fight, she comes in, misses weight by, like, almost 10 pounds. So, I mean, that pretty much lets me know, hey, look, you outgrown this weight class. It's time to move up. And so I'm expecting to see a better uh, Sarah Frota as well. And Sarah Frota, man, you know, like you said, the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, she's very confident off her back that she can get back up. And, uh, I mean, she gets back up for the most part, but she's going to have to do it in a timely manner. This isn't Canada. This is on, I think Julian's from Canada originally. So, you know, she's going to have to uh, make sure she doesn't stay on her back too much. But I truly believe that if Sarah Frota can get back up to her feet a couple of times and keep this up in space, I think if she hits Jillian Robertson on the chin, Jillian will want to go home. You know, I think Jillian's a, a tough girl. I think she's getting better and better, but I still think there's going to be a couple of hurdles here. You know, she's 3-1 and one right now. She's doing very good, but I see another stumbling block on the way. I think when Sarah Frota hits her, I'm not saying that she's going to take a knee or, or, or you know, turn away, but I just think it's going to start to, to lead into her demise. She's going to get less confident. Then you're going to start seeing her shoot from really far out and, if Sarah can just keep putting that left hand, left hand on her, left hand on her, I think she's gonna win this fight. Yeah, I mean, Jillian Robertson, Eddie Alvarez described it best. If she can't get her submission, she completely falls apart because basically she kind of rushes these girls, and I don't mean with a flurry of punches. I just mean she spams the takedowns, and she's pretty damn good on top of you know if you're giving up your neck and you don't know how to defend chokes and this and that. But Sarah Froda is a black belt, is a Pan Am champ now. The reason I'm bringing that up is because I just don't think that Jillian Robertson is going to be passing guard here, taking the back, get those hooks in, you know, sinking a Mata Leon rear naked choke. I just don't see that happening. But the path to victory I do see for Jillian Robertson is that Sarah Froda, she, she doesn't give a fuck about takedown defense because she's so confident in her jujitsu that she'll willingly go to her back and then start trying to attack with rubber guard or start trying to set up the arm bars and the triangles, maybe even a sweep. So there's nothing wrong with that. I love the jujitsu, but what I'm trying to get at here is in Canada, if Sarah Froda isn't making things happen as far as sweeps and submission attempts, she could give up long periods of top control and from there potentially lose a decision. That being said... I just feel like at some point in this fight, when she gets back up to the feet, the power difference is huge here, Shaq, because unlike Jillian Robertson, who's only comfortable in one area of the fight, which is the mat, Sarah Froda's fine everywhere. And I'm not saying her stand-up technique is world-class, but what I am going to say here, Shaq, is that in the women's divisions, you already know that the women that have that knockout power is something different, and it overrides proper technique at times. And I think this is one of those cases where it will, man, because I do think when Sarah Frodo touches Jillian Robertson on the chin, on the temple, on the nose, even even a straight to the stomach, you know what I'm saying? I think Jillian's going to feel it. I think she's going to be running away. I think she's going to start shooting from a mile out. And eventually, I can actually see Frodo getting a submission win or a knockout. I'm going to go with Frodo here for the victory. Now, next up in the flyweight division, we got Alexandre Pantoja. He's 21-3, and and Davison Figueiredo is 15-1. Currently, they got Alexandre Pantoja, minus 125. The comeback on Davison Figueiredo is plus 105. Well, these are arguably the two best, I, I want to say prospects, but they're contenders at this point in the flyweight division. I mean, two of the, the best of the younger generation, you know, because I know someone's going to be like, well, Formiga beat Davison. How is Davison the best prospect? It's like, guys, Formiga represents that old generation. Davison had to take that first L in the UFC. But, man, Pantoja and Davison Figueredo, these guys have very bright futures. Who do you see uh, getting another win here? Yeah, you know, Davison Figueredo, I was very high up on him going into the uh, Formiga fight. 
things didn't go his way. He got taken down, got hugged. No, no shame in that for me because done that to a lot of guys. Um, one thing I did not like going into that fight, I heard Davison Figueredo cut 39 pounds in total in the process, and that's in a, you know 39 pounds. I think it was in like a three week stretch. You know, <laughs> like I that is <laughs> Davison. We can move up. Uh. <laughs> you know, I mean. I don't know if it's because, you know, he got a little heavy after he put John Moraga in a pool of blood and his did, head did, got did, a little Did he get a 50K bonus for that? Uh, no. Um, so, shit. There's no yeah, excuses then, huh, Dan? So, yeah, you know. I mean, it was his first time that really knocked out. <laughs> <laughs> he knocked out uh, Marco Beltran. And uh, he finished that Morales guy. But this was the first yeah, lap. But this was like bloody and brutal. Against the top 10 guy. Yeah. Man. But, uh, man, he got really heavy after that fight and had to cut 40 pounds damn near in that stretch of time, which is, you know, really bad. There's just a fact, like, he's, he was that much over the weight class. is like, you know, Davison, buddy, like, you you're, might want to go to 35s, bro. You're a bad weight, Davison. <laughs> you know, flyweight, and I, bro, that flyweight cut is fucking brutal, man. You know, that's that, like, I mean, look at TJ Dillashaw when he tried to go down the flyweight, you know. Uh, TJ who? <laughs> TJ uh, injector shot, but uh, <laughs> but uh, you know I think that Davison possibly might be growing out of the weight class. Now the the thing is on fight night he's gonna have a very a very big size advantage over Pantoja, and we know what type of fighter Davison is. He likes to stalk guys, he likes to hunt guys, and uh, he likes to utilize his power. And Pantoja, man, they don't call him the the cannibal for no reason. I mean, this guy will stand in the pocket and trade willingly, and, and he's got no issues. I mean, this guy has a history of doing this, dating back to his LFA days. Like, he, you know, I'm not going to say he created the pointing to the ground shit, but, I mean, Pantoja's been down the bang since he came out the womb. I mean, and he's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. You know, it's going to come over. I think this is a good matchup of finesse versus power. You know, I feel like Pantoja's got more tricks up his sleeves. I think he can, you know, utilize uh, taking Davidson's back. Davidson made a lot of mistakes against uh against uh formiga you know and pantoja's been training with formiga you know for the last couple of years so i know uh formiga gave him a lot of a lot of tricks on how to take his back and control him the thing is if they stay out in, in space you know i feel like uh davison might be able to be the one to capitalize on pantoja's willingness to bang pantoja has been wobbled in the past before so is davison and so has Davison as well. Against he, he got dropped against Moraga. I remember that. I remember that fight before the UFC with that fucking heavy metal song oh, yeah, playing in the background. Against uh, Dennis Fontes. Yeah, my boy Fontes. <laughs> that was a great fight. That fucking amazing fight. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's gonna be a really good fight. I feel like this is a very closely matched fight. Like I said, finesse versus power. I feel like the weight cut is gonna be taking a toll on Davison. I feel like. Unfortunately, he's going to have to move up to Bantamweight. I think he's too big for flyweight. I mean, look at the guys that have flyweight right now. We're talking, you know, uh, 39 pounds is a lot, bro. That's like, <laughs> fuck it. Like, fuck all that. <laughs> bro, like, that's fucking ridiculous, bro. I know he, he you know, I feel like he's probably going to come in better shade at a lighter weight. But, you know, sometimes it's better just to be natural, man. You know, just to, uh, to I mean, we've seen it time in... I know, unless your name's Luke Rockhold, you know, fucking... <laughs> and that ain't even a weight issue. That <laughs> guy <laughs> disrespects everyone in fights. That guy has no... He just boxes with his hands down. <laughs> imagine, imagine having no chin and then fighting with your hands down it's like, anyways. It's like, Luke, you don't have a chin, bro. <laughs> you can't be boxing out here with your right hand you know, You know he'll say some shit about, I've never, I've never been, been dropped in the gym. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh my God. Davidson's out going the weight class, so I'm a slightly lean Pantoja. It's not a, it's not a confident, I'm not a confident pick because I do respect Davidson. He does have the only one loss in his career, and the dude's very brutal. I know he's hungry. He's coming off this out, but uh, I feel like Pantoja actually might play this a little smarter with his jujitsu. I feel like he's gonna come, you know, very jujitsu oriented and try to just back, uh, you know, get his back. You know, probably try to try to ride out time, look and see if he can get a choke. Um, and I think he'll get the win. I feel like it's going to be a close decision. Yeah, I mean, I 100% agree with you that Davison needs to move up to Bantamweight ASAP. He should have been moved up. He I mean, when, when you talk about extreme weight cutting, it's one thing. But when you talk about cutting to flyweight, it's another thing because you're literally on the brink of your body fat trying to make 125 pounds. And this is a guy, I mean, he's crying on the scales. You know what I'm saying? Remember that one time? I think, was it the Jared Brooks fight or the, or the Morales fight? He's a guy like, that's dead. Like, he's one of those guys where... You know, you might think you'll pull an Aspen lad, but hey, he knows how to reload. He knows how to put the weight back on, but at a certain point, it's going to affect your performance. And 
here's here's the interesting thing about this fight because the output is going to be won by Pantoja. The scrambles are going to be won by Pantoja. Pantoja is the better fighter all around. It's just Davison brings something to the table that you can't really measure on. That's that power, that athleticism. The guy, I'm, I'm going to say he's a freak athlete. You know what I mean? And I think he'd be so much better at Bantamweight. So, I mean, Pantoja has that willingness to slug. Uh, there is a chance he could get knocked out here for sure. But that being said, I really do think the long-term battle will be won by Pantoja. So, if Pantoja doesn't get finished in the spot, I think he comes out here and wins the fight. So don't get knocked out and you win, buddy. Next up in the featherweight division, we got the return of Gavin Tucker. He's 10 and 1, and Sung Woo Choi is 7 and 2. Currently, they got Gavin Tucker minus 120. The comeback on Sung Woo Choi is plus 100. Well, Shaq, we've been asking for a long time. Uh, when's Gavin Tucker going to come back? We hadn't heard from him for a while, and here he is uh, about to make his return this weekend. He was about to fight uh, Sukumtach a couple months back. Uh, a couple months back, and uh, you know he pulled out of that fight. Only one and one in the UFC. He had the fight against Sam Cecilia. A decent performance. Um, Sam Cecilia is not UFC caliber. Never has. Never. You know, he just never was UFC caliber. And yeah, he danced around him, hit him with some shots. But Sam Cecilia is a basic, stationary, one-dimensional power puncher that you see his shots coming from a mile away. So you know this whole showboating out there and dancing around him and getting the crowd into it it was cute but was it really that impressive not really not to me um sam Cecilia did crack him a couple of times and he made faces off uh made, he made faces anytime he got hit in that fight and then we saw him against rick glenn the gladiator rick glenn a very tough guy uh, you know a grizzled vet and i mean that fight was one-sided as one-sided can be you know he came out there and I mean, right away from the opening bell, Rick Glenn was bullying him around the entire cage. And I mean, we already know, I don't have to exaggerate or put it, I mean, we know what type of whipping it was. I mean, he got extensive facial surgeries and he took the right amount of time off. But I think Gavin Tucker, you know, was really never good, that good to begin with. I think he, you know, was borderline UFC level, but you got to look at it. This guy is very short for 145 pounds. He was in there with Rick Glenn, who's six foot. Now he's in here with Sung Woo Choi, another very tall featherweight i told something six foot five six feet, six yeah, six feet. Feet. so uh, i feel like i feel like sung Wu's a, a lot better a striker than rick glenn rick glenn's a guy that he has to take a beating first a little bit then come back and it was rick glenn that was putting the beating on him from the opening jump that lets me know what type of caliber fighter gavin tucker is not saying that he he's had a lot of time to clear his head and make improvements but i think this guy sung Wu Chu is just flat out better than him you know he had that debut against mazvar evlo evan st petersburg and mazvar that guy's royalty down there, you know. Uh, he, I mean, I've called him mini Khabib at times, you know, uh, watching some of his local scene fights. And there's no shame in getting taken down by a guy that's got multiple world championships and Prancration and fucking Sambo and all this other shit. So I feel like, you know, sang showed enough skills in that fight to... Uh, to say that he's going to be back, and I think he is going to be back on Saturday night. I feel like the range is going to be a very big uh, struggle for Gavin Tucker in this fight. He's a, he's a guy that likes to tap and run, and he's very short. You know, he, his style is more fit for guys his height that are wrestlers. And they likes like uh, Cecilia, you know. Now he's in here with a long, technical, disciplined Muay Thai striker who's getting better at stuffing the takedowns. I mean, he, he stuffed the, the takedowns from Mazwar as good as a guy on his level could, you know. Uh, he's coming in from a different Asian promotion. So I think Sung Woo's going to look a lot better. That fight was also on short notice. Um, Imagine having to fight that guy on short notice. <laughs> well, they just caught both of them like two weeks out. Like, you, know, you, know, <laughs> you know, Evlo was You know, Evlo knew about it a year in advance. <laughs> They're like, Evlo, we're just going to let him know on fight week that he's fighting you. Hey, Asian kid, you want to fight Evlo? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> in Russia? <laughs> on the main <laughs> card? <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, I feel like we're going to see a lot better... Uh, Seeing Wu Choi, I feel like we're going to see him use his range and just pick Gavin Tucker up at range. I feel like Tucker's going to try to come in with these big bombs. But I feel like uh, seeing Wu Choi is too disciplined, man. This guy ain't going to break out of that that standard classic Muay Thai form. I think he's going to get to Gavin Tucker probably towards the end of the first. And by the second round, it'll start to be a lot more one-sided. And I think Choi knocks him out in the third. Hey, look, Gavin Tucker does great with no resistance. If you're just going to stare at him like Sam Cecilia did, then he'll go out there and uh, and knock you out. But when you're talking about a guy like Sung Woo Choi, it's completely different than Sam Cecilia. Because, look, Sam Cecilia, that was his last UFC fight. Already got brutally finished two fights prior. You know, against He's been brutally finished several times. A million times, <laughs> but two times in a row against Duho Choi and Gabriel Benitez. 
And then they put him in there with Gavin Tucker. The kid doesn't even throw a single strike until the third round. Of course, Gavin Tucker was able to do his, uh, you know, his fake Ali shuffle and his poor man's Dominic Cruz impersonation. But the reality here is that I think Sung Woo Choi is actually going to give him some resistance. I think he's actually going to fight back. And then we can talk about the physical advantages where I feel like Gavin Tucker needs to drop the bantam weight. This kid, Sung Woo Choi, he's just a kid. He's young. By the time he's 30, he's going to move up to a 55. I mean, he's six foot tall. He has an eight inch reach advantage in the spot. And the way the styles match up, I mean, if you want to give Sung Woo Choi problems, you got to go out there and wrestle the kid. And it's not just as simple as diving on the legs, he's going to be on his back. I mean, he was trying his hardest to defend those takedowns against Evloev. But when we talk about a guy like Evloev, I mean, he has like a, a Khabib-like ability to end every scramble in the top position. So I don't fault a guy like Sung Woo Choi for taking a hard-fought L to Evloev. I mean, Evloev's a stud. You, you guys are about to see how good Evloev is in his next fight against Grundy. But... Here with Sung Woo Choi and Gavin Tucker, look, Gavin can run around the ring. He can, you know, do his feints. He can do his shuffle. He can do all these things. But at some point, he's going to have to step up. And when it's time to step up, it's going to be a check knee. It's going to be a straight down the middle. It's going to be a high kick. I got Sung Woo Choi via knockout. Next up in the featherweight division, we got Hakeem Dawadu. He's 9-1. And, and Yoshinori Hori is 8-1. and one. Currently, they got Hakeem Dawadu minus 400. The comeback on Yoshinori Hori is plus 325. Well, Shaq, I mean, I understand why Hakeem Dawadu is the favorite here. I mean, he's the more experienced guy. He's the bigger guy, no doubt about it. Yoshinori Hori is coming over from not the same kind of regional scene that Hakeem was on. You know, Hakeem was out there in World Series of Fighting. You know what I'm saying? But that being said, you saw Danny Henry, who... You know, no offense to Danny Henry, but Danny Henry went out there and starched Hakeem Duwadu. Do you think a guy like Yoshinori Hori, you've seen the highlight reel this kid has, do you think he can come out here and get this upset? Danny Henry might not be a fraud. Maybe Ige is just really good. Because <laughs> Ige fucking whooped Aguilar's ass, right? You, you see uh, what uh, Little Tamor did to Danny Henry in that first round? Um, Little Tamor won his ass, right? Man, man. <laughs> I didn't tell some good joke to fall over. <laughs> Taylor's on a, he just won. So, but yeah, anyways, uh, Hakeem Dawadu, one thing I've been, you know, down on him in the past for is because, you know, in his World Series career, man, this guy would literally be out here with that left hand. I'm talking like uh, down at the, down at his, uh, at his kneecaps, man, you know, and you do that early in a fight. Uh, you know, sometimes you get dropped, and he did get dropped. I think it was against Siler early in the fight. You know, he got dropped right away. And then it's funny because going into the Henry fight, I said Hakeem's way better than him. The only thing I don't like is the kid leaves his left hand down <laughs> the entire time. And uh, guess what happened? 20 seconds in, boom, right hand, you know, uh, and Henry tapped him out. Now, he comes back against Austin Arnett. Oh, saw a little bit of the same thing, Not maybe not to the extent. I mean, he fucked Arnett up, you know, hit him with the calf kicks, you know, used the size. I mean, Hakeem, for these guys that, you know, aren't the strongest, that don't have that presence, like, uh, you know, Henry, at least he's six foot tall. I mean, he, Henry's, he's he should have been. Henry. At least he's six foot. I mean, look, when you're, when you're undefeated coming in from World Series, they're hyping you up. <laughs> I mean, the shit happens to the best of them, man. You know, I mean, look, one time Michael Johnson beat Ferguson, you know, one and time Boy. and Boy, you know, was, you know what I'm saying? So the shit happens. One time Court McGee beat Whitaker. Exactly, you know what I'm saying? Court McGee, 30-27 Whitaker. <laughs> <laughs> that, was a, that was a weight cut thing. But, yeah, so I feel like Hakeem. Oh, what Boy, was it? Uh, <laughs> nah, it was definitely a weight cut. Was, but, uh, yeah, so Hakeem DeWatu. I feel like he's definitely the, the the stronger fighter in this spot against Yoshinori. Yoshinori's definitely got some punching power, but he hasn't seen anyone near this level. No offense to his uh, past opponents, but Hakeem Dewado is going to be the real thing now. Now he's got a puncher's chance early, but one thing I liked about Hakeem's last fight is I did see some in his fight against. But I don't know how that was a split decision. Man, that was crazy. Bashiak's <laughs> got a way of fucking man. <laughs> Bashiak's got a way of fucking making those decisions look close man but man that was crazy that that was a split decision but one thing i liked is you know the smaller guy boshnia going into that fight i i i mean i considered betting boshnia you know going into that fight but one thing man is whenever they got close man the smaller guy had to back up because akeem duwater is just too strong he's too physical he you know although these guys you know they feel like yoshinori 
Uh, I'm sure he hits hard, but can he take a shot as well? You know what I'm saying? He ain't never been hit on the chin like Hakeem's going to hit him. I got Hakeem by getting back to his knockout ways. He hasn't got a, a knockout in a long time. You're going to see him get a little more comfortable in that octagon. And I think, uh, you know, hometown, Canada, you know, this is a tailor-made spot for Hakeem to come out here and shine. And I know they had big plans for Hakeem when he, when he uh, came over. He fucked up against Henry. I think, uh, you know, he's got his head on his shoulders right this time. And I think he'll knock this guy out. Probably in the first or second round. Yeah, I mean, Hakeem Duwadu's definitely paid his dues to come in with the kind of hype that he had, be the kind of big favorite he was, and go out there and get starched like he did. Listen, man, that's either going to make you or break you. You could have came back unmotivated, like, you know, it's over, but that's not what happened, man. Came back, won two fights in a row. So I'm really excited to see what he does here. And I really felt like in that Bochniak fight, despite it being a split decision on paper, that was the best Hakeem's ever looked inside the octagon, man. Uh, just his presence in there, the physicality. And when he decided it's time to start mixing in those combos, uh, it's deadly. I mean, that left hook to the body, the, the right roundhouse. I mean, the, it's called the Jose Aldo. You know what I'm saying? That left hook to the body followed by that right roundhouse to the leg. Uh, love that combo. I mean, I, some might call it the Dutchie, but I, I call it the Aldo in uh in MMA, you know what I'm saying? But as far as Yoshinori Hori, man, I love this kid. He's fucking awesome. Uh, he kind of has that old school Kid Yamamoto style kind of dart back and forth. And when it's time to crack, this kid can crack. He knocks a lot of people out very, very fast too. So if Hakeem thinks this is some kind of joke, if Hakeem thinks it's kind of cute, wants to fight with his hands down, Yoshinori Hori is live for the knockout. The issue is if Hakeem goes out there like he did against Bochnia, hands up, technical distance is on point shot selection is uh, where it needs to be he's gonna win this fight because as much as i like this kid yoshinori hori i think he's got a bright future i honestly think he needs to drop the band away man he's too small for the ufc featherweight division now over in japan you could be fighting these guys at featherweight you know i mean you see my boy horiguchi over in japan He's fucking running ship up a weight class you know what i'm saying so but in the ufc you got to stay in your weight class man unless you're one of the most special athletes we've ever seen, unless you're a triple, a triple C, C, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> or, or Daniel Cormier or one unless of those guys, awesome you know, <laughs> unless, unless you're that great. But I, I love Yoshinori Hori. He's very exciting. I like him a lot. He's a little spark plug, but I just don't see that in him at this moment. So for that reason, I'm going to take Hakeem Dewadu as well. Next up in the flyweight division, we got Canada's own Alexis Davis. She's 19 and 9, and Viviane Araujo is 7 and 1. Currently, they got Viviane Araujo minus 230. The comeback on Alexis Davis is plus 190. Well, Shaq, you got the lady that knocked out Amanda Nunes at plus 190, and the lady that knocked out Talita Bernardo is minus 230. What's your perspective on this fight? If they want to hold on, yeah, that's like, I mean, a lot of people knock Amanda out. You know out. that's true, right? <laughs> Sarah, Sarah, Sarah DeIlly will knock Amanda out back in the day. <laughs> Cats and Gano. <laughs> Cats and Gano knocked Amanda out back in the day. But, uh, yeah, you know, I feel like uh, Alexis Davis has had a lot of great accomplishments. I mean, she has been, a, you know, somewhat of a who's who list in, in, in the sport, a pioneer of the sport, 12-year plus career. Uh, she's 34 years old now, beat Nunes, beat Jessica I, beat... Uh, Tanya Evinger, Liz Carmouche twice, uh, Kaufman, Sarah Kaufman, Valerie Letourneau. I mean, the girls, you know, she's been around the block. I mean, she's been doing this shit since, uh, she beat my girl Cindy Dandoa. She was doing this shit since I was in elementary school, you know what I'm saying? Um, but yeah, you know, seems like lately she's uh, hit kind of a stalemate in Arujo. I mean, man, what a performance she had against Alita Bernardo. You know, some people, might uh, be like, you know, well, it's only Talita Bernardo, but at the same time, when I, you know, want to estimate calibers of fighters, she took that fight on four days' notice up two weight classes. You know, she's originally a straw weight. Now they, you know, telling her to fight at in the middle ground 125, you know, but they're taking care of this girl now. You know, they don't want her to cut too much weight or be fighting she weighed in at 131 pounds now <laughs> and she went out there and it wasn't even no it wasn't a close fight the first two rounds the shit was a wipeout it was outclassing and Toledo Bernardo yeah she's not the best but I've seen two other top 15 girls go in there with her and uh Marion or no Marion or no I think finished her and uh Irene you know handled her pretty well but in both those fights Toledo got takedowns um, she got on top of both those girls against Arujo. She couldn't sniff a takedown, you know what I'm saying? And uh, against uh, the other girl, the Canadian girl, uh, the beat Evan Smith-Morass. 
Uh, you know, so Talina, obviously she wasn't the best, but she was number 15. Why isn't Morass on this card? <laughs> <laughs> she, they fed her, they're feeding her to some prospect they got. I forget the girl's name. So, yeah, I mean, she was number 15 in the weight class. And the fact that she absolutely went out there and wiped her out, not a close fight, on four days notice, lets me know what type of... You know, you know, I was a little curious. I was like, man, that's very impressive. Four days notice, you know, I was thinking, ah, Toledo, you know, whatever. But then I went back and watched some of those Pancrase fights. And I mean, one thing about Viv, Viv Arujo, man, this girl comes out with that swagger, that confidence, that footwork, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. In comparison to Alexis Davis, Alexis is also a black belt, very known for her arm bars. But one thing about Alexis Davis is she hasn't evolved since she uh she hasn't she, firstly you know she's from that stone age of uh of females in MMA you know and I feel like she's one of these first ladies that unfortunately her luck uh, her time's running out because when she came back from having a baby or her fight before the baby against Sarah Kaufman you know Sarah Kaufman's a very one-dimensional stiff puncher I mean look Alexis was getting tagged up that entire time that entire fight hurt um got wobbled in that fight but you know for whatever reason these girls uh take her down and then they put themselves in trouble for her arm bars, and Sarah Coffin's got no ground game, and she was able to get that when she comes back. She has the baby, comes back against Sarah McMahon, you know, just doesn't look like she's ready to fight. Got absolutely dominated, took him down, hurt with punches as well. An arm triangle. And she has a sh one of the shittiest fights I've ever seen with, uh, that's not necessarily her fault, Cindy Dandwa. My God, that's... By the way, Cindy Dandwa finished Megan Anderson. <laughs> So all you guys that bet Megan against Felicia and Holly. <laughs> oh, man. Because <laughs> I know Megan got steamed in both those fights. <laughs> like, I, I know we, we called Alexander Hernandez a fraud. And, you know, between you and me, he didn't really win that fight. But that's more kind of fun. And this well, and that. no, Hernandez is a different extent. Yeah. He's a that, 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 that's, that's, that's fun <laughs> talk. You know what I mean? We, we actually respect Alexander Hernandez. <laughs> but Megan Anderson, no, that's an actual fraud. Like, that's an Instagram model. <laughs> So, yeah, you know, she had one of the worst fights. Uh, I think you went to that fight, right? Oh, I saw Cindy Dan over to Alexis Davis in oh, Nashville. Man, man, currently I'm, I'm on Wikipedia looking at Davis's uh, record and something hilarious. Next to the Cindy Danwell fight, guess what they got in the notes? <laughs> fight of the century. <laughs> whoever hey, whoever uh, wrote Liverpool. fight of the century on... Uh, Cindy Dan Roberts, Alexis Davis, hit me up. I got you on this week's pits, man. And then the Liz Carmouche fight, that was a very interesting fight because, you know, she has beaten Liz prior before that. Liz has a style of kind of backing up, kind of looking for her slams or wrestling. She doesn't really like to throw a lot of punches. And uh, it's interesting because Liz would hurt Alexis on the feet. Like, Alexis has been wobbled in, like, her last four or five Look, fights. Ronda Rousey knocked her out in <laughs> under 20 seconds. Look, she got wobbled against uh, Sarah McMahon. Uh, Liz Carmouche, Chukagian wobbled her, had her doing a chicken dance, and Jennifer Maya damn near got her out of there in that uh, in that first round, really close to knocking her out. Um, so I feel like her durability's going down the drain. I feel like she has not evolved. Arguably, she could have been in a spot where she hurt. these last five fights she's been in have been very very questionable. I mean, the Liz Carmouche fight, Liz, that was a case of bad eye fight IQ. Why, when you hurt somebody, why would you take them down and you're now you're in a position? Well, because Liz likes to be on the mat. That's her comfort zone. But she put herself in position to lose rounds by hanging around in that arm bar. But personally, VV Arujo, I mean, the shit that I see from this girl on the mat, I mean, I feel like the UFC might have a prospect on their hands here, man. Like, I feel like she is clear cut ahead of these girls that she's been fighting on the local scene. I know she took the loss to Sarah Froda, but hey, big fucking love. Everyone loses a fight. And uh, I feel like this girl is a serious black belt. And on the feet, I feel like the feints, the feints, the footwork are going to completely confuse Alexis Davis into making big mistakes. And she's already a girl that makes big mistakes against these lesser talented fighters, in my opinion. Now, I know Arujo doesn't have the experience, but Arujo is a little older in age. She's 32 years old. She's a little bit more mature than these typical prospects. I think she's got a good head on her. I think she overwhelms Alexis Davis with the footwork. And I feel like she might get another knockout. Alexis makes a lot of mistakes that she has never corrected over the years. Like I said, these last five fights of hers have been very, very fishy. And, uh, you know, I know she's in her hometown, but I don't think the judges are going to play a role in this fight at all. 
I see uh, VV Arujo putting on an absolute clinic. You know, I see why people like Ali Abdelaziz are behind this girl. And I, and I feel like they got a big prospect on their hands. So I got VV Arujo by finish. I think Alexis and Stavis, you know, had a great career. Beat Nunes, beat I, beat, you know, uh, all these girls. But I, I just think uh, it's VV's time now. Yeah, uh, listen, very, very impressive UFC debut to take it on a week's notice and go in there and put on that kind of performance. Now, granted, it was Talita Bernardo, but then again, even the people that have gone out there and finished Talita Bernardo, I've never seen anyone destroy her bell to bell like that, Shaq. Ground exchanges between Vivienne and, and Bernardo were all won by Vivienne, man. I mean, she passed that guard effortlessly like butter. And the thing I was most impressed by was obviously the stand-up technique. Even though, you know, she fights with her hands down, but in that division, you could totally get away with it when you're, you know, you're not fighting the, the top five girls and this and that. But Man, how good is her jits, bro? Like, the, those passes were very, very on point. And here with Alexis Davis, you know, initially I kind of was interested in, in my girl Alexis Davis because I was like, look, this girl fought goddamn Talita Bernardo. I've seen her against two UFC caliber fighters, Talita Bernardo and Sarah Froda. Sarah Froda put the pressure on her and got her out of there relatively quickly. And then she fought Talita Bernardo and she took care of biz. So... I was kind of like not that sold, but then when I see the technique, I see the evolution compared to her past fights, I really do think that she has a bright future. So basically what Alexis Davis needs to do here to win this fight is obviously don't get knocked out, don't get picked apart. She has to put the pressure on Viviane Araujo, be the bigger fighter in there, bully her to that mat, get past the, the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, and try to get a submission of her own. But that's so much easier said than done, Shaq, because the speed that Viviane Araujo is dealing with is something to behold in this kind of matchup because Alexis Davis is, you know, a walking punching bag. I mean, you guys saw that Cindy Dandwa fight, fight of the year, I know, but when you look at that technique and you compare it to someone like Viviane, I think Viviane's got some major advantages. Now, there's always first UFC L time and these kind of things, so... You know, if, if Vivian pulls some kind of stunt, it's not going to be the biggest surprise in the world. But ultimately, I have to go with what I've seen. And she's so much faster, so much cleaner, a lot more potential. I'm going with Vivian Araujo here as well. Next up in the main card, in the middleweight division, we got Christoph Yatko. He's 20 and 4. And Mark andre Barrio is 11 and 2. Currently, they got Christoph Jotko, minus 150. The comeback on Mark andre Barrio is plus 130. So, I mean, look, man, there's a couple questions we need to know. Uh, is Christoph back after that performance against Amadovsky? And also, can Mark andre Barrio get back on track after the very close loss to Andrew Sanchez? Yeah, it shows what they think of Barrio to give him another, you know, top, you know, 30 guy. Sanchez and Jocko for his first two UFC fights. Hey, that's, that's being thrown into the fire, but they got to throw him into the fire because he was a two-way uh, world champion in that Canadian promotion. TKO he, champ he champ. TKO, yeah, he was a TKO champ champ. So, I mean, hey, <laughs> but you got to sink or swim. So now he's in here with Jocko. The fight with Sanchez was not a bad performance at all. You know, I, I had Sanchez going into that fight. Man, Sanchez is one of these interesting guys. He, he's very, very talented. The guy's a... World champion jiu-jitsu guy. He's a national champion wrestler. He's got taekwondo kicks. The guy, honestly, Sanchez, if he can figure out his, his mental shit and his, and his cardio, <laughs> his car, it's really his cardio, if he can uh, figure that shit out, you know, the guy could actually be really good. I mean, he won the Ultimate Fighter, so, you know. Uh, but now he's fighting Jocko, who was on quite the skid. I mean, man, I jumped off the Jocko train a long time ago. I mean, since he fought Dave Branch, I jumped off the Jocko chain. Um, Jocko, yeah, we noticed <laughs> it in the Talos fight. We were like, Christoph, <laughs> calm yeah, down. Like, Ch Ch Christoph, your chin is sky high, <laughs> But, uh, you know, so, yeah, since the Dave Branch fight in which he got tied up, he, you know, Christoph was a guy that when he was, when he was the number one prospect in the middleweight division. 19 and 1. When he was 19 and 1, he was a guy that used his footwork, finessed these guys on the outside, made them make mistakes, and, you know, kind of weasel them out, kind of, you know, uh, just point them up. And, you know, the guys would think they won, and then they'd say Christoph's name, and they'd be like, wait, what? <laughs> Like, ask him, like, Brad Scott. Like, I remember that. I bet on Jocko against Ask him. And I remember uh, Ask him was like, <laughs> ask him was like wait, what? 
And Brass Christoph got freaked out. And uh, Christoph was break, already break dancing, twirling in the air. You know, when Christoph has to break dance. Although it's good to see Christoph. Break he only dance. break dances when he wins decisions. Yeah, it only has to be a decision. Yeah, but uh, but but Askin was already uh, when Askin was complaining, Christoph his legs almost hit him from the break dance. But uh, anyways, man, Christoph definitely is not back long in the long term scheme of things. I mean, he beat fucking Amadowski. That guy's a complete can. Um, I mean, no offense. I saw no offense. I mean, I, I've seen SVG guys. You know, uh, no offense to SVG either, but <laughs> <laughs> no offense to SVG either, but uh, or I'm the talking best about selling the, author. I'm coach. talking about the Be- the Bellator SVG guys. You know these events that they go to uh, Ireland and they put all these uh, SVG frauds on their cards. One of those guys got on uh, Amadowski's back and almost choked him out. Now Amadowski came back to knock him out, but hey, like, that guy. Uh, yeah, he's a, he's not you. Charlie Ward. Yeah, you know Charlie Charlie Ward. Charlie Ward. What's the what's <laughs> name of the leg lock guy? Uh, Richie Smalley. Richie Smalley. Yeah, Peter Quilly. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> the only one I fuck with yeah. is my boy Artem. You know Peter Quilly lost to an O and O guy. I got. I saw you got a fight in Bellator actually. Um, but anyways, give me odds. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, how I see these two matching up, Jocko is definitely the more elusive guy, probably slightly faster. But I feel like Barry Alt's more of a bull, more of a hard nosed guy, more of a, a tougher guy. No offense to Kristoff. You know, Kristoff when he fought David Branch and and it got a little grimy, a little slimy, he was putting his hands up, begging the ref to separate them. When he fought Uriah Hall, you know, he pulled a, a rookie move. He came out, tried to tee off on Uriah, it didn't work out. And I mean, Uriah, that was some of the worst whiplash and follow up shots that I've, I've seen in the middleweight division. And then Brad Tavares kind of put the uh, icing on the cake. And I mean, when Brad Tavares gets a knockout, that's. Right. <laughs> Let's just put it like I, I know Brad very well, and I've, I've said Brad's one of the best decision fighters. Did you know that the last time Brad knocked anything out was Phil Barone, was Phil Barone <laughs> yeah. at UFC 125? That was the night that Frankie fought Gray the second time when it went to yeah. a draw. Tiago Silva was playing the drums on Brandon Vera's face. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, Dustin made his UFC debut that night, you know. Yeah, it's Josh Brisky. <laughs> but uh man, so yeah, he got knocked out towards Tavares, then he they were gonna put him in there with Andy F, so I guess they were trying to get Kristoff a win. And he got that win, but now it's back to the real Or they game. thought, man, who's one guy Andy F can actually beat? <laughs> What's Jocko up to? <laughs> Andy F went out there and fucking got his ass whooped by Jordan Johnson, uh but yeah, now Kristoff is back to the real thing. Now he's fighting a hungry guy that, I mean, I know Burial needs a win here. Who wants to start the UFC career off 0-2? And I, and I know they had a lot of high expectations because they're putting him in fights with Sanchez and Jocko right off the Pay-per-view bat. Pay-per-view main card. <laughs> Pay-per-view main card. And, you know, his performance against Sanchez was good, man. You know, Sanchez has that ability to tie up and wrestle. And Jocko just got some good wrestling, but he's not on Sanchez's level. Sanchez is a two-time NAA uh, national champion. You know, he's just not that caliber. Um, so I feel like that's really what held Barry all down was those stall- the stalling and the tie-ups. Honestly, I feel like that's what the fight came down to. I mean, in the second round, you saw Barry all teeing off on Sanchez. And Sanchez, it looked like he was looking for a way out. It looked like he was going to pull a- another stunt. But when you got that back pocket, you know, that wrestling in your back pocket, and, you know, Barry all just quite re- wasn't ready for that level. I, I actually think Barry all's probably... You know, probably feeling a little confident. You know, I feel like he's probably going to go back to the gym and, you know, correct those mistakes. I mean, that's a little adjustment right there, you know, getting off the fence. I know Jocko's probably going to try because I feel like Jocko at this stage in his career, you know, yeah, we know that uh, with these KO losses, I know... You know, Mike Brown, I know them, they're, they're telling Jocko, let's let's right. work around that chin, but <laughs> we need to work around that chin because, you know, his chin hasn't been tested since that Tavares fight. And I'm sure Kristoff's a little more confident as well. He finally got back on the winning track, saved his job in, in, in some sense for now. But, uh, you know, if Burial hits that chin, Burial carries a lot of power. He's not the fastest guy, but like I said, he's a bull. He's a grinder. The longer this goal, and if Kristoff can't hold him on that fence, Unfortunately, I think Barry Alt's going to possibly touch that chin in the late rounds. I feel like Kristoff's probably going to get up to a good start with the dancing. But, you know, eventually he's not going to be able to run for too long. And eventually, Barry Alt's going to close that distance and probably land a big overhand right. Barry Alt carries a lot of power. Had a very, very, very tough road to get to the UFC on that TKO. I mean, two different weight classes, 205 and 185. So I feel like Barry Alt's on the same level with Kristoff, to be honest, skill-wise. Now it's just about... 
kid, you got to do it now. You know what I'm saying? You're on his level. They're giving you these opportunities. I think he gets Kristoff out in the late rounds. I feel like Kristoff just hasn't been tested. You know, I'm not going to put any stock into him beating Amadoski. I mean, Barry Alt would beat Amadoski with the heart, with the one hand tied behind his back. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, I got Henry Saluto over at Modowski, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Real talk. So, yeah. So, uh, I think Barry Alt's going to be just a tougher guy. Stay on him and, uh, you know, break him in the late round. So, I got Barry Alt by late uh, third round TKO. Yeah, one thing I like about this kid, Mark andre Barrio, is that after his fight with Andrew Sanchez, he said, look, man, I got to make some changes. So, he actually went to try to a train with Andrew Sanchez. He trained with him before that fight, too. It's crazy. Oh, nice. Spar, they bought him in the spar Sanchez, like, uh, like one of his prior fights, and then, uh, like, he got the call to the UFC, and the old Sanchez's name. <laughs> he was like, "I just sparred with the guy last week." <laughs> yeah. Well, now after their fight, he went back to spar with him some more, yeah. and I think that's a that's a good sign, man. That he's willing to branch out. He's willing to work on the things that he needs improvement on. I mean, what better way to work on the holes that? Andrew Sanchez exploited then by going and training with Andrew Sanchez like hey man we saw this weakness please help me fix it up please help me patch this up and here with Christoph Jocko I was under the impression that oh maybe Christoph's back and this and that but when I watched that fight with Amadowski again like guys uh I really am not under the impression that Christoph can shoot halfway across the room against Marc Andre and get him down I know Marc Andre had some issues with Andrew Sanchez but that was more up against the fence and eventually he was able to get back up, you know, and in that second round, he, he was pretty damn Sanchez. dominant. Sanchez is a different story here than, than Christoph Jaco. I know Jaco went out there and took down my boy Talis Latis and this and that, but, you know, Talis was a couple <laughs> fights away from retirement. You know what I'm saying? Back, back in the day, no one used to take well, down Jack my boy Jack Hermanson beat him with one rib. <laughs> you know, my boy, uh, Jack Hermanson, you know, <laughs> and, and Mark Goddard's help. Thank, thank you very much for that one, Goddard. I appreciate you, my man. Thanks for not stopping that. <laughs> Look, but as far as Jocko and Mark andre Barrio, look, Kristoff's going to come out here, try to do his dance, try to fire off that left kick, not get into any exchanges with the hands because he, he knows his chin, his chin is completely done. And look, man, at some point in the second round when Mark is stuffing those takedowns, he has gotten back up and they have to actually throw some hands in a fist fight, that's when Kristoff's probably going to go down. So... I'm a big fan of Kristoff. You know, he came through for me a lot back in the day. I'll tip my cap to that guy, but I'm going with Mark andre Barrio in this spot, man. I think he gets off to a slow start, but eventually he finds his timing, finds his range, starts to be able to have more success, keeping the fight upright. And once he does that, I think he lands a big shot on Kristoff Yako, man. So I'm going Mark andre Barrio via knockout. Next up in the lightweight division, we got Olivier Aubin Mercier. He's 11 and 4, and Armin Sarukian is 13 and 2. Currently, they got Armin Sarukian minus 200. The comeback on Olivier Aubin Mercier is plus 170. Well, Shaq, you got a kid who many people are very high on, Armin Sarukian. He's taking on the Canadian gangster here in Canada. Which way are you go? Canadian gangster, man. He is really. Uh... <laughs> He's really uh, more like the Canadian librarian or something. That's what, <laughs> that's what he looks like. But, yeah, this is going to be a good fight, you know. Um, Jake Lindsay's the Canadian librarian. And, by the way, <laughs> Jake Lindsay inside tripped oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, this is going to be a good fight. You know, uh, man, things have definitely turned south for OAM this past year. I mean, at the uh, beginning of 2018, I mean, things couldn't be higher for OAM. You just beat Rocco Martin, finished Evan Dunham, Dober, T-Bow Gowdy. These last two fights with Alexander Hernandez in a fight where, you know, you guys already know my thoughts on that fight. Um, you know, I looked into it a little bit. OAM says he overtrained. Uh, he said that after the Dunham fight, he jumped right back into camp or something. Like, I think there was something where Gilbert Burns, yeah, him and Gilbert Burns are supposed to fight. He stopped training, but then some shit he said. Basically, he said he was overtrained for the because he was supposed to fight Gilbert Burns, and that didn't happen. Then uh, he had to stop his training and then jump right back into training for Dunham, but then that was a quick finish, and then he had to go right back into camp for Hernandez. So he says he was overtrained for the Hernandez fight, and he said that's why he pretty much gassed out. Then he got a chance to come back against uh, Gilbert Burns. And Real quick. So he was overtraining. How come when he did that Kimura sweep and he got on top with that straight armbar, what's that got to do with overtraining? Uh, I don't know. He said he was overtraining. What is, 
when you have a guy full mounted <laughs> and you drop back for a leg lock <laughs> instead of finishing him, how is that overtraining? Yeah. But, uh, you know, he says he was overtrained for the Hernandez fight, um, you know, and then he comes back against Gilbert Burns, uh, caught him with a, a big left hook in that first round. We know the type of power Burns possesses. I mean, Gilbert Burns is turning into a, a potential top 15 fi uh, fighter. It's looking like, you know, he's won, what, four out of his last five, only lost to Hooker. Um, so, you know, now we got, he's fighting Sarukian. You know, I do think it's a step down in competition in comparison to the last two, Hernandez and, uh, and Gilbert Burns. You know, Sarukian had a good fight against Makachev. And now when I say good fight, I mean good fight as in we didn't know who the kid was before. We knew Islam was fighting uh, a newcomer. And sometimes in matchups like that, when you got, a, uh, you know, an established name like Makachev versus a a guy you've never heard before, kind of, for example, um, Peter Yan versus Jin Su Son, just because uh, he went three rounds with him and, you know, he didn't get finished and didn't know his name. It doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, this guy is a surefire prospect. Now, Sarukian, I will say, is very good for his age. I mean, the fact that he's already this good at 22 years old is, is definitely very impressive, and it, it lets me know, future-wise, he's going to be good to go. The thing with Sarukian is he's being thrown into uh, a spot where he's probably not ready for it. You know, he sh probably should be fighting. I mean, his first two fights are Islam and OAM. Now, I'm not saying OAM's um, some fucking world beater or anything like that, but he is top 30, 35, you know. He, he's somewhat respectable. And I do think it's a step down from what OAM has has, uh, has been fighting lately. The thing with OAM is you already know how to feel about OAM. His heart, you know. <laughs> I think that, you know, that the guy is good at fighting these calm fights where he can pick his jab, where he can throw his left kick, and where guys don't pressure him. I feel like he has good success there. I feel like OAM is very talented. I mean... He's a judo black belt. At times, he'll show you these good flashes of these really good takedowns. Very physical. Very physical. I mean, at times, all I am will show you like, damn, that was that was very nice. All I am, you know, he trains at TriStar. He's surrounded by good people. It's just that these last two fights, and these last two fights, just lets me know that he was never going to be a, a t in the title pick when he was ranked. When he hit those rankings, that was the ceiling of his career, most likely, and it, most definitely, it was the ceiling of his career. So now, all I am's in a spot where. Like, he's got a sink or swim. Like, I'm not saying this is, I don't, I don't think if he loses, this is going to be it for him. But they're feeding him to a guy that they're very high on, a very young guy. And it, and it lets me know that, look, they probably want only him to come out here and take three L's in a row. The thing with Sarukian is, his fight with Islam, personally, I didn't think it was that competitive. Like, I thought that the kid, well, you know, I watched, I watched all his fights in order. So, I already knew the kid was a very good wrestler. So the dudes that he was taking on were he beat Felipe Oliveri. He uh, he beat... Uh, Sato. Takanori Sato, that guy's a can. <laughs> but he beat, he knocked out Felipe Oliveri with a head kick. Um, he, he, there was another UFC that he beat. Junior Asunta. And Junior Asunta. Sarukian's a guy that, you know, I don't want to say he's one-dimensional. I'm going to just say that he just needs more time. He just needs more time to develop. He's 22 years old, and they're throwing him into the fire right away because he's that good for his age. So Sarukian's going to have to raise his, his level up, and, and it's a good thing that he's doing that. Now he's being bought out to ATT. Now he's a part of Dustin Poirier's camp. You know, now, you know, these people are putting in his positions, and sometimes... For these young kids, it might overwhelm them, or, you know, they might, guys like Sarukian, it seems like he's got a good head on his shoulders, so I think it's going to benefit him overall on Sarukian. Like I said, the line is, what, minus 210, I think, and, you know, I, I personally, I probably don't think he's going to finish on him, um, or, like, necessarily, like, dominate him, like, I think that, uh, He's probably going to be the, the aggressor of the cage. I think he's probably going to be uh, what they call octagon control moving forward. The thing is, on the outside, when he strikes, he really doesn't throw much. Um, OEM, I'd say, is probably overall a better striker. You know, at least throws his hands more. I mean, Sarukian really just takes guys down, you know, stays in their guard, beats them up. That's what he's done for the most part in a lot of his fights. In the Islam fight, you know, he, he got close to taking Islam down, which is which is very good and all, but personally, I feel like, you know, Islam Makachev, although he's number 14 in the division, very good, 
You know, there's two fights before that where Cajun Johnson, Glayson Tebow, in which he dominated. And, you know, just that pattern. It could be like, you know, people were expecting Islam to go out there and demolish the kid. And just the fact that he, he didn't demolish the kid, the performance can kind of be overblown. That's my only concern. You know, I don't think Sarukian's anywhere near the level of Fernandez and, uh, and Gilbert Burns. I, but I am high on the kid because he's very, very young and he's very talented. But, you know, it is minus two. I'm not convinced on his overall skill set just yet, but I do like his wrestling. OEM has been struggling. He did gas out against uh, Hernandez. And, you know, if he was fighting anyone else, I'd be like, no go. But just the fact that he's fighting Mercier, it's probably going to go his way. So I will pick Armand Sarukin by, you know, 29-28 decision. I think he's just... Probably not necessarily just dump him over and over, but just probably hug him against the fence. Oh, and probably wilts a little bit, but I think it's probably going to play out a little closer than the line says. I like this kid, Armin Sarukian, a lot. And I actually think that if his name was Armin Sarukinov with the OV at the end, he'd be a bigger favorite here because this guy brings that Russian coasting style to the table. Yeah, he's not going to overwhelm you by throwing a big barrage of strikes and he's with, you know, even though he does have a nice high kick knockout on his record against Felipe Oliver, but he's not going to go out there and really impress people with his one punch knockout power or anything like this. But one thing I got to say about this kid, Armin Sarukian, is nine times out of ten, when this guy gets into a scramble, he's going to end up on top. And when you're fighting a guy like Islam Makachev, who, you know, I mean, the guy is, you can say, is around the same level of, as could be with his wrestling in there with Daniel Cormier and all these guys every single day. I just think that's a different level. And I still thought that Armin Sarukian looked pretty damn good in those scrambles. I felt like a lot of those entries would have easily taken down a guy like Ovin Mercier. And I agree with you that Mercier's stand-up is probably better. I just don't think he's going to have the space necessary to get off on that. You know, I do think he's going to be able to land you know, a big kick here and there, maybe, you know, close the distance and get the fight into the tie-up off a couple strikes. But when he does that, that's when Armin, Armin's going to be able to duck under, pick him up, slam him, get him to the mat. And from there, I don't see much resistance on the mat. So I really do think that Armin Sarukian is going to cruise here. I think they handpicked this fight for him. I like Mercier. I mean, he's a talented guy. I know, you know, we've called him the Canadian fraud and this and that. Look, it's, it's nice to have fun on the show and say all these things, but at the end of the day, like, I respect the guy. He's got a very hard body kick. He's stuck around in the lightweight division for a while. Got nothing against him, but this kid, Armin Sarukian, very, very talented at his style. Very, very efficient at what he does. Like I said, he's not going to be very flashy with the stand-up. He's not going to go out there, establish his jab, and really impress you with these, you know, mixing it up to the body. But what he will do is, when he wants to take this fight to the mat, he will take this fight to the mat, and I just don't think that Olivier is going to be able to get back up as much. And I see uh, Armin Sarukian grinding out Olivier Aubin Mercier for all three rounds, and I think he's going to get his first UFC win, and we got a very bright prospect to watch here, only 22 years old. Next up in the welterweight division, we got Jeff Neal. He's 11-2, and two, and Nico Price is 14-2. and two. It says 13-2, and two, but you and I both know he knocked out Alex Morano, so he's 14-2. and two. Currently, they got Jeff Neal minus 345. The comeback on Nico Price is plus 285. Well, Shaq, I mean, you and I both know why Nico Price is the dog in this in this fight because essentially it's KO or bust or sub or bust. He has to finish this fight to go out there and win. Now, we've seen Jeff Neal get finished after whooping someone's ass before. I know you saw the Kevin Holland fight back in the day. Do you think Nico Price is going to come out here with his uncanny ability to finish fights? And Find one out of nowhere, whether it's hammer fist from bottom or some of the other crazy shit he's done along the way. Yeah, Nico Price, Jeff Neal, that should be that should be uh, and and fairly quickly. I mean, both guys just hit too hard, you know, and you know for it to not end quickly. Jeff Neal, I mean, his three fights have been pretty much flawless. You know, even though the Bilal fight was a uh, not a shaky second round, but you know, Bilal kind of answered back. But the fact that he, you know, Bilal's a guy that outworks guys. You know, Jeff Neal outworked Bilal, you know what I'm saying? So, That's crazy. Uh, you know, Nico Price is a guy, he's uh, he's in that group that I, I classify as, you know, not necessarily a comeback fighter, but just, uh, you know, it seems like every fight he's in, the odds are, are he's, a, he's a dog in most of his fights, the, the, uh, the odds are generally wide, and uh, Rizak al for whatever reason, that, that fight was, uh, you know, a pick'em, I think it was, and... Uh, 
you know, he got knocked out. And then, you know, Means, they had Means up at <laughs> north of minus 200. And Tim was, you know, just rushing, you know, look, when you fight a guy like Nico, all the openings are there. I mean, you see all the openings. You're like, oh, my God. Can't help yourself. Oh, my God. I'm going to knock him out. <laughs> He's slow as fuck. He doesn't move his head. Fucking, and Nico uses that as a bait to get guys in. And if and the guys that are going to get caught in it are the guys that rush it like Tim Means and, you know, don't fight with composure um, or just a little old like Drew Band. Randy Brown, you know, look, Randy Brown's probably more talented than Nico, but he got sucked into Nico's shit. You know, I feel like Jeff Neal's honestly on a different caliber than those guys. You know, I feel like Jeff Neal is very disciplined, keeps his hand up, is very defensively sound you know he doesn't trade sloppy in the pocket and you know that's where nico capitalizes he wants guys to trade Scott because i'll be honest with you nico you know he's not fast but man you could tell when he lands like these guys fucking start seeing stars you know what i'm saying and the thing with him in this fight with neil is to have any success in this fight he's either gonna have to time a shot and it's gonna be hard to time a shot because neil's like light years faster than him um, or he's going to have to, I don't see him taking Neil down. I mean, Bilal has got one of the better shots. In the, I mean, Bilal took down Ren Counter, took down Randy, took down, you know, all these guys, Melender, you know, all these guys. And, I mean, he, he got Neil down, and Neil popped right back up. And it kind of kind of deterred Bilal, man. And Bilal's a top 25 guy. So I feel like Nico Price, honestly, in the scheme of things, really isn't that good, but he's a game motherfucker. You know, yeah, he, he kind of, and he's in that group where, you know, I have, like, uh, Barb in the past where, you know, you watch tape on him and it's like, this guy kind of sucks. But then, for whatever reason, when they get in there, he's got a, a vibe, a aura about him. He's a warrior, man. He's a modern-day gladiator, man. The guy will go out on a shield for sure. I know he ain't scared. The thing is, I just don't see how it's humanely possible for him to not move his head and eat that too, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And to stay awake and keep going. I mean, look, the means fight was pretty much how this fight's going to go. It's just that you're going to see a guy that's a little bit more composed, younger, fresher, not uh, 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 more durable. And I feel like, you know, those same, it's pretty much going to go like the means fight, but it's just Nico's actually going to be the guy unconscious and <laughs> and not on the cage screaming, you know. So I, I got a lot of respect for Nico Price. Like I said, sometimes he, he could, you know, he is one of these guys where you watch tape on him and it's like, Ugh. but you know, when they get in there, it's a little different. And man, I just saw the I just saw the stare down him and uh, Jeff Neal had. So it's gonna be a war, man. But I gotta go with Jeff Neal by first round knockout. I, I just think his punches are too straight for for Nico. I know Nico's coming, and I, and I respect Nico's power. Jeff Neal needs to be very fucking careful. Don't make any two, because Nico will land these sneaky uppercuts, and dudes will start, you know, doing a little chicken dance. So I'm going to go with Jeff Neal by first round KO. Shout out to Nico Price. He's a very nice guy. But uh, unfortunately, I feel like he's going to have issues like how he had against Rizak Alassane with the raw power. Or Vicente Luque, you know. Vicente just had him in and out with the footwork, and he just wasn't able to... He was confused, so I feel like he's going to have similar problems. Did you know that Nico Price knocked out the last two southpaw fighters he fought? Tim Means and Alan Juban? Yep. And now he's fighting another southpaw. Will, will he make it three in a row? Or <laughs> is his third time going to be the charm for the southpaws to come out here and finally beat Nico Price? Look, the thing with this matchup here is the massive speed difference between Jeff Neal and Nico Price. You know, we can look back at that fight with Tim Means, and, you know, Tim Means is known for his crisp clean striking down the middle and he was getting off on it but the issue is that tim means is i mean not only is he post usada not only is he at the end of his run but tim means has been getting rocked in a bunch of fights i, I ain't even just talking about alex garcia. i ain't even just talking about the nico press fight what about the alex garcia fight there's plenty of other ones too uh my boy matchy brown mm -hmm. shout out to my boy matt brown you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. but anyways as far as this matchup here i just really feel like when Jeff Neal starts closing that distance and, you know, once he decides to let the combos go, because at first, you know, he likes to feel out that jab, likes to throw out that left kick. And by the way, that high kick will be open as well. But once he has Nico backed into that fence and it's time to really unload, I think that's when it's going to be it. I think that's when he's going to knock him out. But look, he can't come in here cocky. He can't come in here, you know, chin up, hands down, think this is some kind of joke just because his teammate Razak knocked out uh, Nico Price too. You got to respect this guy because one thing about Nico, he can finish fights at any moment from any position. The guy hits extremely hard. He's very, very tough, durable. He's what Shaq likes to refer to as an elite scarecrow. You know what I'm saying? So 
Jeff Neal needs to be on his P's and Q's. And if he is there, if he's disciplined like he was versus Bilal Muhammad, he's going to come out here. He's going to knock him out. The speed, the accuracy, the precision is just too much. Now, the punching power too, right? So I'm going Jeff Neal via knockout. Co-main event of the evening in the featherweight division. We got Chris Cyborg. She's 20-2. and two, And Felicia Spencer is 7-0. and up. Currently, they got Cyborg minus 700. The comeback on Felicia Spencer is plus 500. Well... We saw Felicia Spencer go out there and tap out the last striker she faced. I mean, it wasn't really a striker. It was an Instagram model. But now she's taking on the, the legend, you know, the former champ, Cyborg. First of all, where do you think Cyborg's confidence is at after such a devastating result? Do you think Felicia Spencer can come out here, take the back, and strangle her? Yeah, you know, I'm going to be cook with this one. I got Cyborg my first round stoppage. You know, I like Felicia Spencer. I think she's got a bright future, but I think she was more of a beneficiary from a girl that's an Instagram model, you know, a Megan Anderson. You know, you know, I actually picked Felicia Spencer in that fight after an interview I heard from Megan. You know, I was going to pick Megan, then I heard this interview, and I mean, Megan's head is like all over the place, bro. Like, she thinks about all this shit that she shouldn't be thinking about. And it's probably because she's six foot and she's cutting down to 145. And, you know, uh, poor Megan. Go fight Pedro. <laughs> Poor Megan. Felicia Spencer, you know, she's a nice girl, but, uh, you know, she's got some good jiu-jitsu, good takedowns, but this is a whole different ballgame. Now, whether she got knocked out by Nunes or not, I mean, it makes no difference to me. I feel like this is... Like, a big, not a step down, but a fucking drop down. Like, fucking, there's only a few girls in that division. This is just, this is a fight. Get Cyborg a win before they go into negotiations. You know, they, they wanted to get a, or her, her team wants her to get a spectacular KO. You know, go into negotiations, get this, you know, 500. And, and you know, fight Nunes again. And you know, I heard she might leave. Um, motivated or not, I just don't think Felicia Spencer should be in the same cage with her. You know, I, I like Felicia. She's got some, but look at her past fights before Megan. I mean, those fights were ugly. But, you know, when you're fighting Megan, it'll work out. But Cyborg, you know, I feel like Cyborg, in terms of comparing her to Amanda Nunes and the, and the Durandamies of the world, you know, my, my top three female fighters are you got Nunes in there. You got GDR in there. Girls with a real skill set. Like, Your you top five. Yeah, like, we're talking Amanda, GDR, Cyborg. I mean, Cyborg's not really the skill, but just the brute force, you know, the power, the, the booing ability. You got uh, Andrade, and then you got um, Valentina, you know. So I feel like Cyborg's still in that top five, you know, caliber range. Felicia Spencer's only got one fight in the UFC. This is a mismatch. The line can honestly be a little wider, but she's coming off a loss. But I feel like the line should be honestly like minus 1,500, minus 2,000. Like... Felicia Spencer's a cute girl, but, like, <laughs> when she gets hit, she's going to fucking want to go home, bro. <laughs> like, she's never been hit like this before. Megan's, you know, got some good striking, but no composure. Cyborg, I feel like, you know, she's a bully. And, you know, when she fights Amanda, she won't be seeing that canvas uh, again, you know. She will, be, uh... <laughs> she will be seeing that canvas again. But this ain't Amanda. This ain't nothing near Amanda. So, you know, I got to go with Cyborg here by first round side. Yeah, I mean, look, Felicia Spencer does have some of that soccer mom stand-up, and that's probably going to cost her here. But if I had to make some kind of case for Felicia Spencer, I mean, I have kind of felt like Cyborg is, you know, no disrespect, but a tad bit overrated. I mean, let me give you my examples. You know, that Lena Landsberg fight, I was expecting a stoppage in under a round, you know, and she made it to the second round. The Tanya Evinger fight, I was expecting the first punch, we're going to go home. Tanya Evinger's last into the fourth round. You see a man, you see Holly Holm go out there, get starched by Amanda Nunes in the first round. Holly Holm's taking Cyborg all five. So, and I picked Amanda Nunes via submission. I was wrong. It was a knockout, but I still picked Amanda. And the reason why I thought there was some kind of weakness in Cyborg's ground game. You saw that fight with Yana Kuniskaya. Yana takes her down effortlessly with that low single early in the fight. So, even though I think Cyborg is going to ultimately win, probably knock her out. If Felicia somehow can take her back. That would be that would be the recipe for the upset right there. But I do have to side with the favorite here. I'm going to go with Cyborg inside the distance. Main event of the evening in the featherweight division for the featherweight championship. We got the champion, Max Blessed Holloway. He's 20 and 4. And the challenger, the former UFC lightweight champion, Frankie the Answer Edgar. Or as we like to say in Brazil, Shaq, Frankie Edgar is 23 and 6. 
Currently, they got Max Holloway, minus 350, the comeback on Frankie Edgar is plus 290. So what's really interesting to me about this matchup, Shaq, is that we haven't really seen Max Holloway in there with an elite wrestler, at least since Dennis Bermudez back in the day. And you know what I'm saying? I mean, was he D1, right? <laughs> Ricardo Lamas, is he D1? Did you see what I'm saying here? So we haven't seen Max Holloway tested versus an elite wrestler. Now he's going up against the great Frankie Edgar, future Hall of Famer, former lightweight champion. You think Frankie Edgar has the answer to dethrone Max Holloway? Yeah, it's going to be a good fight. I know you guys in the past have heard me say guys like Frankie, the Cubbies of the world, the Lamases, the Elkinses, the Bermudas. Is, you know. You're not Bermudas, me, Holloway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like fucking 10 years. Complete robbery. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I have been on the record to say that I feel like those guys are fading out. You know, now Max Holloway. You could kind of say he's from not necessarily, you know, their generation because those guys have been fighting longer than Holloway. But, you know, in terms of the featherweight with the guys that I'm that I'm going to refer to in a second, the Volkanovskis of the world, the Sabits of the world, Zombie's been around for a, a long time. He's still but, evolving, though. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, those guys, so D, been, those, guys, those guys in particular, you know. Uh, those guys, I mean, I mean, just watch Frankie has pretty much been using the same things for, you know, 10 plus years. We know what Frankie does. He's a good wrestler. He comes in with the pity pat, then the over-the-top shot. His last few wins, uh, Cub Swanson, a little underwhelming because Frankie Edgar, he's a fundamental fighter. He's going to use the basics. You know, he doesn't possess that type of athleticism or speed or he's just, a, he's like I called him earlier. He's, a, he's consistent. You know, we know what Frankie's going to bring to the table. You know, Frankie's not really going to necessarily lay an egg i mean unless you call the ortega fight an egg <laughs> or the aldo fight an egg but i just think those guys are a lot frankie is very limited physically against these elite world-class athletes frankie you know he's been fighting once a year recently his last five fights are jose jeremy uh ortega cub and now here so yeah he's been fighting like once a year you know lately i don't see that much of long men i just think he's um, he's consistent we know what he's gonna bring it's just Typical Frankie Edgar, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, but maybe he has one good last performance in him, you know. But personally, I just don't think, I don't want to say the guy's physically not capable, but I just think now he's fighting these guys like Max Holloway, a long, grangy striker. Now, I know Max is coming off a, off a hellacious beating down here in the ATL, but I mean, look, that's a little, I don't see too many guys looking that good taking a hellacious beating, you know what I'm saying? He looked great in that fight. Like, to be honest, bro, like, his punching volume was through this roof. I mean, I think they threw both guys through. I think Holloway might have threw 400 punches that fight. Dustin threw, like, 300-something. And, I mean, the volume in that fight was crazy. And, you know, I like Frankie Edgar, but I just don't think he can, you know, I think he's got good cardio, but we're talking... You know, making reads on the adjustment for five rounds. Like, Max and Poirier, that was a great fight. Like, those guys were trading. Like, you got the big power shots of Poirier versus the long straight Chris punches of Max. And, you know, Max, I do see, you know, I'm going to be honest here. Down the line, I don't see Max keeping that 45 belt for too long. You know, I'm going to go ahead and pick Max on. I think he's going to get this win over Frankie Edgar this weekend. But down the line, he's going to have... Uh, you know, a lot of... A lot so, of so you're saying Volkanovski is the... Yeah, I'm, I'm saying Volkanovski would whip that ass, yeah. You know, I got some other guys over him too, zombie fucking... <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, I think that he's, Holloway will get through this fight. Like, Frankie Yeager, if he backs up against Max Holloway, he's too short. Like, if Holloway starts coming in, coming forward in this fight with those barrage of punches, I'm not going to... I think he actually will get TKO because Max Holloway will start throwing... 20, 30 punches in a row. And if Dustin Poirier, you big 55-er. A champion. A, guy, a champion. Like I said, Frankie Edgar, uh, his his basics his basics have kept him around at the top five for the last 10, 11, 12 years. Um, but in the in the last five, six years, it has not got him, got him that world title. And I don't see any, I don't see it being different. I feel like this is more of a... I don't think they view Holloway in the sense of a of a, of a Nunes anymore, probably just because of that last loss. But I feel like this is a, a fight to get Holloway and a big name on his resume. Oh, yeah. you know, he got he got the Jose Aldo fight. You know, uh, it's the last legend left. Exactly, it's the last legend. I feel like this is honestly Frankie's last hurrah. I got utmost respect for Frankie. I don't want to sound like you know I'm shitting on him or anything like that, but. I just think that the range is going to be too much. I don't think the wrestling is going to be a big factor. Like I know Dustin took 
took Max down, but you know, I know Frank has got the collegiate the collegiate wrestling, but guys, this is MMA and you gotta be able to think on the fly while taking punches. Now, I think that Dustin Poye was a man possessed that I don't think anything would have gotten Dustin Poye's way. I feel like Frankie's a little older. I feel like if Frankie is in a fight where he's taking that much damage, I feel like he is going to get deterred. We've seen it in the past before, like in fights against Jose Aldo. He did. I just saw him get picked at range by Brian Ortega. No offense to Brian Ortega, but he can't box. And and the fact that Ortega, you know, was ranging him up at range, it lets me know that Frankie's days in this 145-pound division are over. There's too many long, tall, powerful, serious athlete guys like you said, a Sadiq, a Calvin K. And man, oh my god, like bro, 40 like 45 Frankie's fucking like at 45, bro. It's a beat, like his boys a beat, like no offense, his little bros a beat would probably whoop his ass. Like, let's be honest, man. like dump him around the place, you know what I'm saying? So I got the utmost respect for Frankie, but I just don't think it's gonna work out here. I think this is Max Holloway's last title defense. But you know, Holloway, in terms of his stock right now, I feel like he took that loss against Dustin Poirier the best you could take it. I mean, he didn't make no excuses. It's not like he said, uh, you know. <laughs> what kind of shit was Connor saying after his Khabib loss? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It wasn't like he was like, uh, you know, he made up some bullshit reason. He said he got beat. Dustin was the better man. You know, he. he, he you know he's a real champion, man, and I think it's gonna. I think it's gonna. Uh, he's gonna be rewarded on Saturday night. I think the volume's gonna be too much. The range is gonna be in his favor, and I feel like Frankie's gonna have a tough time pulling the trigger. And I'm not worried about the takedowns, man, because Holloway gets back up. But his jujitsu's on point. Like I, I think the days of holding Max Holloway down are long over. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, uh, Frankie might get a takedown or two, but to sit here and act like he's going to consistently take down Max Holloway for a five-round duration, I mean, at least on paper right now before the fact, sounds kind of crazy to me, man, unless Dustin just softened that chin to a point where Frankie Edgar can come out here and knock him out. And I got all the respect for Frankie Edgar. He's actually one of my all-time favorite fighters. When I saw him fight Tyson Griffin, it was at that moment where I said, this guy will be a future UFC world champion. Then you and then you fast forward to his fight against Gray Maynard, the third one, at UFC 136 in Houston, Texas. That was actually the first UFC event I ever attended. So I love I love Frankie Edgar. But, you know, when we're picking these fights, I mean, the guy, he's closer to 40 than he is to 30. Let's just leave it at that, Shaq. And you're talking about the featherweight division. He already had an incredible run, man. He was the guy that dethroned BJ Penn, you know. For him to come out here and win this fight, he needs to stay in the face of Max Holloway all night long. He needs to mix it up up top with that overhand, try to mix in the takedowns as well. But man, I just feel like he might be able to do that for a couple minutes, but when Max starts getting off on that range, starts firing those straights down the middle, starts stepping through with his combinations, starts mixing it up to the body, and then he adds a couple spin kicks in there, it's gonna be a formality at some point, man. So what I'm really trying to wonder is if this is gonna go all five rounds, if it's gonna be a wipeout from pillar to post, or, I mean, are we looking at a fight of the night where Frankie is able to mix in takedowns and get that top control? I just don't think so, man. And I do think that Holloway's stand-up, excuse me, his get-up game is pretty damn on point. You saw Brian Ortega shoot that double leg in that third round and get him down. You saw the immediate shuck. You saw the immediate wizard. You saw him get right back up to his feet, man. Uh, Max Holloway's been working on all areas of his game here, and Assuming that, you know, Dustin didn't damage him too much. I mean, dude, I, I really don't think that's the case, man. They had an amazing fight of the night. Both guys took damage in that fight. You know what I'm saying? Dustin Poirier hits way harder than Frankie Edgar. Man. We can name all the people Frankie Edgar's knocked down on one hand. Mark Bocek, Gray Maynard, Chad Mendes. Anyone else? Yeah, he didn't knock out yeah, yeah. And The doctor knocked out yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> no one went out cold in that fight. Look, if they run it back, Yair's winning that fight. I don't give a fuck what anyone says. Uh, <laughs> much respect to Frankie. Uh, but yeah, look, I'm going at Max Holloway to keep his belt. Hats off to the legend, Frankie Edgar. You will be in the Hall of Fame. Thank you for being one of my all-time favorite fighters. I'm going Max Blessed Holloway and still the featherweight champion. Can't wait to see him fight Volkanovski. Make Volk the underdog. And now we got to hit up Kyle Marley for the Big Marley Minute. And joining us now on the Big Marley Minute is Big Marley himself. Kyle, it's going down this weekend in Canada. You know Max Holloway has a good history there. He's fighting the legend Frankie Edgar. How's it going? Not bad, man. Uh, definitely looking forward to that fight. You know, a couple more, but this is kind of one of the weaker pay-per-views. I'm not excited about spending 60 bucks to see it, but we do have 50 k up top for DraftKings, so I'm looking forward to that sweat. Man, I mean, let's get right down to business because... 
Like I already alluded to, the former lightweight champion Frankie Edgar is taking on the reigning defending featherweight champion Max Holloway. I mean, you think Max Holloway is going to come out here, put up 100 plus points with that output? Or do you see Frankie Edgar getting the takedowns and winning that way? Yeah, I mean, it's hard not to go with Max Holloway here. Uh, he has one of the higher ceilings in the sport. I mean, definitely from striking. He's not a guy that's going to go out there and look to get takedowns, but he can put up 190 fantasy points with just his striking alone. Like, he, this guy's ridiculous with his pace, um, and he's DraftKings gold. So I definitely love Holloway here. But Edgar puts up one hell of a pace himself, too. Um, and if he wins at $6,800, he's for sure going to be on that 50K lineup. So this is just a fight you got to be all in on. Um, if you're entering multiple lineups, uh, there, there's probably not many that I'm going to have without this fight. And I'm going to have, you know, 30 plus lineups probably this weekend. But if I was making one, I have to go with Holloway. I think he's going to get the job done and he's going to land a ton of significant strikes in the process. I'd be shocked if he didn't score over 100 points. Um, and I think he's got the highest ceiling on the whole card. So got uh, you got to love Holloway here. It's a great stack in cash fight because I do think we're going to have, you know, 140 or so points total in this fight if not more which i love for stacks um so i'm down for that uh but i'm not gonna rule edgar out so if i'm making like 10 lineups i'd probably go like eight holloway to edgar something like that because edgar's somewhat live here i mean he can definitely use his wrestling mix in his boxing make this fight uh just different for holloway in general uh something he's not used to and i think edgar's gonna go out there win round one have a bunch of people shaking in their boots, and then Holloway's going to figure them out, come back late, win a decision. So I got Holloway winning, um, at worst, rounds three through five, but probably rounds uh, two through five for a unanimous decision. So co-main event of the evening, Chris Cyborg's taking on Felicia Spencer. And Chris Cyborg's not only the biggest favorite on the card, but she's also the biggest favorite in DraftKings at 9,600. You think she's going to come out here with that first round finish and uh, cover that 9,600? Yeah, I do, man. I think... I think this has first round finish all over it. Even if Spencer wins, it's going to be, you know, the first minute of the fight with a takedown and a submission. But I, I would be completely shocked to see that happen. This is this has Cyborg written all over it. I think she's going to stuff that initial takedown and then punish her and finish the fight in the first minute or two with strikes. And I think she's the safest bet on the card for 100 points. But she doesn't have the ceiling, you know, of like 150 that Holloway would because Felicia's not going to be putting up enough uh she's not going to take that punishment you know what i mean to let her get to that many points so you're you're like paying for the safety i think but if you're looking for ceiling i'd rather save the 200 bucks here and go holloway if you're choosing between the two um but i'm gonna have a, a bunch of both of them uh i probably won't have a single lineup without you know holloway or cyborg they're the best two plays on the card and i'm gonna be loading up on them are you going to at all be using Spencer just so you can afford some of the other bigger favorites? Uh, no, I, I think I'm going to full fade Spencer here. Because I tried to make one lineup with her earlier today, and I didn't like how it was starting out. So I said, you know what, fuck it, full fade. Uh, I'll probably put Cyborg in like, I don't know, like 60 to 70% of my lineups. But I'm going to I'm gonna do a full fade on Spencer here. So in the welterweight division, Jeff Neal's taking on Nico Price. What a hell of a fight. You know for a fact that there's no way this can be boring. And Jeff Neal, he's been putting on a show every time we see him fight. You know Nico Price can end the fight at any moment's notice. The winner is definitely going to score a lot of points. Uh, which way you lean and how much uh, ownership you're going to have on both? Yeah, this is another great fight. I think these final three fights are going to be super important for DraftKings. Um, with this one, we got a minus 425 fight doesn't go to decision line. Um, so this is a great GPP fight because whoever scores is likely going to score highly. And I think they're going to be on that 50K lineup. So I will be loading up on this fight. I like Neil Moore. I just think he has way more ways to get it done. I'm super impressed with him. Uh, I love his striking, and I think that's how he's going to get it done. He's going to knock out Price probably in the first um, first two rounds, I'm thinking. Uh, but if Price wins, there's no doubt in my mind that he will be on that 50K lineup because I don't see I don't see him getting a decision win at all here. I think if he wins, he's going to be putting Neil out with a knockout, and at his price of $7,200, there's a good chance he could be on that lineup. So um, I will be hedging a lot of my Neil lineups with Price, but if I'm making 10 lineups, it's another one where I'm pretty much going all in. I'm probably doing like 7 Neil, 3 Price, or maybe even 8 Neil, two price something like that but i love this fight my preferred pick is neil i think he gets it done by knockout 
In the lightweight division, Olivier Aubin Mercier is welcoming Armin Sarukian to Canada. We know Olivier Aubin Mercier has the experience advantage, but do you think Armin Sarukian's wrestling can overcome that and score a lot of DraftKings points in the process? Yeah, I mean, I'm impressed with Armin. I think he's a legit prospect. Uh, it's going to be a great fight to see where he's at. Uh, I think he is going to get the job done. I picked him to win a unanimous decision here. I think he can really win the fight anywhere. But my issue is we got the the Holloways and the Cyborgs on this card where I can't really afford too much Armin at his price. I definitely want him in some lineups. I'll, I'll make it a point to get him in, you know, at least 15, 20% of my lineup, something like that, I'm thinking. But I, I would rather try to pay up for, you know, a Cyborg or a, or a Holloway if I could. So he's not going to be a must play for me at all. And I do think um, Oliver is a little bit live here, actually. Nobody's going to be on him. I think Armin's going to be one of those, you know, popular picks this week. Everyone's really high on him. And I think this could be somewhat of a close fight. And if it is in Canada, so if OAM can go out there and win it, even if he doesn't score highly, this is a card where I really don't like the underdogs too much on this card. So any win could maybe do it. If he can go out there, get a close split decision win, maybe he could be on that optimal lineup. So I won't completely fade him because uh, I do think he is live. But overall, this won't be a fight that I'm really targeting too heavily. I'd rather target those three fights we just talked about. And last but not least, Christoph Jocko is welcoming the former TKO champ champ, Mark andre Barrio, uh, to, to open up the main card, man. So... What do you think? I mean, you think Barrio's going to get back on track, get that first UFC win, or do you think Jocko's going to continue the win streak that he desperately needed? See, I just mentioned I, I really don't like underdogs on this card, so I am going to go with Jocko again as my winner here. Uh, I think he's going to point fight his way to a decision, but I think takedowns are going to be key for him in this fight. If, I think he's going to win you know, two rounds from takedowns, maybe get a clear 29, 28, something like that. But I'm definitely more interested in, and Barry out here if I'm choosing between the two. I don't see Jocko scoring highly, and he's way too highly priced. I'd rather talk. I'd rather roster any of the favorites we've already talked about than Jocko. So I might even have a full fade on Jocko just because I don't think he has much of a ceiling here. But if Barry all wins, I think it's more likely that he gets a knockout. So at his price, a knockout would do you a whole lot of good. So my preferred play here is Barry all, even though I'm picking him to lose. Um, I'll roster him enough to where I'll be rooting for him to win, you know, but. Since I am picking Jocko to win, I'm not going to be too heavily invested into Barry Alt, but he is one of the underdogs I like more on this card, uh, and more so for the ceiling for that knockout potential. Well, Kyle, that's why you are the DraftKings guy for half the battle. It's going down this Saturday in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. They can follow you at Big Marley 3, and your bets and your write-ups are available at bestfightpicks.com. That's right, man. I just uh, sent those bets over to you earlier. We got three plays this week. Uh, the write-up's already done. A little over 17,000 words this week. That's only 8 bucks. Uh, so let's get it. Let's make some money. Uh, good luck to everybody listening. Now we got to talk about the fight to watch and the fighter to watch. So Shaq, what is the fight to watch for UFC Edmonton, UFC 240? On the fight pass portion of the card, actually, in Eric Koch versus Kyle Stewart. Because, look, I, I know Eric Koch's got a heavy heart. He's fighting for, you know, his dad passed away while he's been gone. I know he's fighting with a heavy heart. And, man, what happened to this guy, man? Like, I used to be a part of the Koch heads. Not really, but fucking. <laughs> but I remember when this guy was knocking Francisco Rivera out in the blue cage and, you know, uh, you know, beat, knocking out Bindi Casimir and, you know, being Jonathan Brookins and getting his number one contender fight. And it's pretty much gone downhill. I mean, he's had a couple wins here and there, but... Like, man, I want to see if this 170 thing is really is really uh, his answer. But Kyle Stewart also, I mean, Stewart, I'll tell you, right, this guy brings it. I mean, this guy is a dog. He's not pretty. He's a little goofy. You know, that's why I think it's going to be a good matchup. You got the straight punches versus uh, the big power punches from this, you know, Coke's a little more coordinated. You know, you got Stewart's a little flat-footed, but Stewart's a dog. Coke's a, a, a pretty boy. You know, I want to see... Uh, Who's willing to get down dirty? Or is if the skill level of Coke could be too high? So that's my uh, fight to watch. 
Yeah, that's a great fight. I mean, so much on the line for both guys. You know the hunger of Stewart, a second and none. And the technique and the skill of uh, Coke, he's going to look to use that over Kyle Stewart. So I can't wait to see how that fight unfolds for me. My fight to watch is Alexandre Pantoja versus Davison Figueiredo. Look, this is number three versus number four in the world. They buried it on the prelims. Maybe they think it's going to be such a close fight that both guys aren't going to take too many risks because they respect the other guy so much, this and guy, this and that. That might be the case, but man, when you got the skill level that both these guys have, Pantoja so well-rounded, the black belt in jiu-jitsu, the knockout power on the feet, then you look at a freak athlete like Davison Figueiredo. He can knock anyone out. He can jump with the fly knees. I'm very excited about Pantoja versus Figueredo. That is my fight to watch. Well, Shaq, who is your fighter to watch for UFC 240? My fighter to watch is going to be Viviani Vivi Arujo. I feel like the UFC has got a prospect on their hands at 125. I think uh, this girl's a complete package. And, you know, if she can get a win over Davis, who's beaten some of the best of the best, like I mentioned before, Nunes, uh, I... Who else? Uh, Kaufman, Liz Carmouche, things like that. You know, I feel like that's a very big win for her, for her in her second UFC fight, and it'll only be, uh, you know, bright skies from there on up. Yeah, and for me, my father to watch is Armand Sarukian. Look, this is a guy that came into the UFC with a lot of hype to the point where his UFC debut, they didn't just put him first fight of the night, you know, let's test him out against some low-level guy. Hey, Armand, you have to fight Islam Makhachev in the co-main event in Russia and the kid stepped up, took the fight, got fight of the night, and now he's on a main car on a pay-per-view against Olivier Aubin Mercier. I think the kid brings something very special to the table with his scrambling, with his scrambling ability and his takedown. So for that reason, Armand Sarukian is my fighter to watch. Well, Shaq, we did it. It's going down this weekend. UFC 240 in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Shaq, we got to let them know that they can save 10% off your bets, off your individual package by using the code Shaq at bestfightpicks.com. My boy Shaq, up over 20 units on the year, almost 25, over 40% ROI. I'm killing it as well and uh, got some nice plays this weekend. Make sure you hit us up at bestfightpicks.com. Let's get this money. Follow me at Best Fight Picks. Follow Shaq at MMA Genius 05. Our sponsor for today's show is my boy MMA Lock of the Night for his MMA Lock of the Night Challenge. Look, the deadline is this Saturday, July 27th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. So don't forget to hit up my boy MMA Lock of the Night if you want in on that Lock of the Night Challenge. DM him at MMA LOTN and let him know that half the battle sent you. I can vouch for MMA Lock of the Night. He's a, those are uh... Those are good people over there, legit people. Let's sign up for that contest. And, you know, like you said, with our best this weekend, you know, if you sign up for my individual plays, not only am I doing buy one, get one free, fuck it, I'm going to do buy one, get two events free, you know, for this week. So if this uh, event doesn't cash, you get the next two events. I think that's UFC uh, New Jersey, Colby and Lawler, and UFC uh, Uruguay, Shevchenko and Liz Carmouche. So if you don't win this event, then you get the next two free. What if you do win this event? If you if you if you do in this event, then you gotta sign up for a month. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like but said, guys, no no obligation. Just say no that. obligations. But like you said, over uh, 20 units this uh, so far this year. Looking, uh, you know, uh, I took a slight L last week. No shame, uh, you know. Fuck Texas judges, but it is what it is. <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, I'm looking to get back on track for this Canada card. I mean, we've been on track all year, and it's going to continue this weekend. Just looking to get another big win. Stay humble. Stay working hard. BestFightPicks.com. Thank you guys so much for all your support. Follow me at BestFightPicks. Follow Shaq at MMAGenius05. Subscribe to Half the Battle on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify. We're on a bunch of other places, too, so just search Half the Battle. Thank you guys again. Another thing, you know, uh, I got to personally thank everyone that listens to the show. You know, sometimes... It's uh, you guys don't know how much it means to us. You know, this is we like uh, we love everyone that watches fights. You know, there's not too many people around uh, in our area that are intense uh, into the UFC as us. So we appreciate all you fans that leave your comments, whether they're positive or negative. And, you know, we had 13,000 listeners uh, for the Jones Tiago Santos card. And, you know, if any of those 13,000 uh, Listeners are out there. If you got any business, you got businesses you guys want to promote. We're uh, down for it. Just uh, shoot us a message at uh, bestfightpicks at gmail .com and you know we can get you situated. But uh, we appreciate all the support. We uh, we love all the kind words, whether they're positive or negative. And you know. Uh, Keep putting your input in, guys. Yes, sir. Love all our supporters, even the haters, man. Just keep our name out there. Thank you guys so much for everything. Go to bestfightpicks.com for the plays. And until the next time, let's cash these bets.